the notes. Is that notes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one. Oh, cool. Should have popped it there. Um, awesome. Last slot of the con. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for hanging around for the very last end. Uh, for those of you who haven't presented at conferences, basically the way it works is you submit CFP, you do nothing for a period of months until about two days before the con, you freak the fuck out, you're like, ah! put the slides together, freak out until your talk, and then once your talk is done, then you just chill out, you have fun with your friends. So being in the last slot of the con, I'm not exactly sure what I did or did not do that I should or should not have done, but I'm very sorry to whoever put the schedule together. I'm sorry, I mortally offended you. I promise I will or will never do that again. Um, but no, honestly, really glad to be here. Um, uh, thank you all for hanging around, and uh, we're pretty excited to present to you. Um, let's quickly hit next and make sure that, hmm, we might have a minor technical issue that the slide notes are not up, um, but we can pull them up in a little bit if we need. Yep. Or, yeah. All right. We might take a couple minutes now just to get that running and then do that. Uh, customize presenter display and then require that we have presenter notes. And then we can get back to it. Sweet. Cool. All right. So let's jump into it. Uh, so today we will be talking to you about Kubernetes. Um, uh, so we'll give you a bit of a brief introduction. Uh, we'll give you an overview of uh, 101 and a bit of background. Um, talk about ourselves, of course. Uh, and then we'll go into uh, some of the approaches I take uh, when I've uh, uh, been on some of my assessments of attacking Kubernetes itself. Uh, and then we will get the hell out of the way. Oh, we'll, we'll discuss some fixes, of course, of, of how we can remediate some of these things. Um, but before we jump into that, of course, uh, live audience participation round. I love this bit. Uh, so who here, uh, and of course Kubernetes, for those unfamiliar, means helmsman in Greek, and being attackers, we're attacking the, the ship. Uh, so a uh, big party yar for participation here, please. Uh, so who here has never heard the word Kubernetes before, maybe has like heard it once, uh, yeah, but really doesn't know anything about it, give me a big yar. A uh, couple of people, okay, not a whole lot. Um, who here has maybe used it once or twice, is aware of it, but is broadly unfamiliar with Kubernetes? Give me a yar. Okay, a bit more of the audience. Um, uh, those playing along at home, please just yar in Discord chat. I want the whole wall just to be like Twitch stream style of yars, that'd be great. Um, who here uh, has, has used Kubernetes a whole lot, uh, has maybe administered it uh, or has attacked some clusters before? Give me a yar. Couple of people, awesome, cool. Uh, and who here is just here to troll us? <laughs> Most of the audience, wonderful, of course, it's a hackathon. Uh, we know where our audience is, uh, that's, uh, that's great to, to have you here. Um, secondly, as well, uh, we've been informed uh, that no fun is allowed. I'm not allowed, like, if you're here for the opening ceremony today, they banned me from telling dad jokes, which instantly is about 70% of my material just gone. So we'll improvise. Um, but uh, no, jokes aside, um, uh, this is actually Abby's first time presenting on stage. Uh, so if you do want to heckle, uh, feel free to heckle me. Uh, be nice to Abby. Give Abby a big round of applause. First time speaking to the security guy. Um, Cool. Uh, this is also a bit of a, like a poor one out for the, the homies as well that couldn't make it here. Um, uh, there are a couple of empty seats here um, for those online and, and uh, that would have loved to have been here. We would have loved to have had here as well. Um, so let's jump in. Um, who are these fine people and, and why are they standing in between you and, and, and the beer? Um, so who are we? Um, Hey, I'm Frenchy. Um, I've been in security for just shy of 10 years now. Um, uh, I'm the infrastructure security fan, uh, lead over at uh, Brex. Brex is a company over in San Francisco. Uh, I normally live and work in San Francisco, uh, but I'm pretty glad to be in New Zealand right now, to be honest. Um, uh, been a pen tester, been a dev security engineer, a bunch of things. Abby. Hello, I'm Abby. Um, I am brand new to security. Um, I just finished my degree program earlier this year um, from the States. Um, I actually got my first degree in psychology with a focus on positive or preventative psychology, a um, little bit of a non-traditional route to security. Um, ended up working as an EMT for quite some time um, until I realized that wasn't really quite for me anymore. Um, fell back on some skydiving skills, as one does, um, until I found what I was really wanting to do and what I was really passionate about, um, which brings me to why I'm standing in front of you now, because I found it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, you might also be wondering why we're wearing these weird uh, motorcycle helmets and looking like that we're having an aneurysm. Uh, actually, this photo is meant to be upside down uh, and looking like this. 
because uh, this is actually how Abby and I met. Um, Abby is as an iFly tunnel instructor, so an indoor skydiving spot. Um, uh, that's how we met. Um, we knew each other for a couple of months before she mentions, like, yeah, I just finished my degree in cybersecurity, I'm looking for a job. I'm like, ah, oh. uh, which kind of is awesome, just goes to show that hackers kind of come from all walks of life. So, so Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Kubernetes? K A S? Kates? Yeah. Uh, Francesco. <laughs> Um, first, we're going to talk about what it is. We'll touch on the official definition. We'll talk about why are we here. Not the existential why we're here. We all know that's 42. More or less, w why is it relevant? What problems did it solve? We'll touch on architecture, and then we will talk about the building blocks. Official definition. Uh, an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Basically a long-winded way of saying it takes a heck of a lot of the time and energy out of administering your containerized applications at scale. Um, it started at Google. Uh, it was called Borg, which is just really fun to say. Shout out to any Trekkies in the audience. Um, it was originally developed to meet Google scale. It was donated to the Cloud, Na uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation in 2015 and released as open source. Um, it since then has beat out its competitors in these container wars to basically become the de facto standard for containerized, uh, for ca container orchestration. Um, it's worth investing your time in. Um, I learned all about Kubernetes uh, to give this talk. Um, and it, I found it incredibly interesting. So if you're looking for something to learn, I highly recommend. Yeah. Um, but before moving on to Kubernetes itself, I want to take a step back and look at uh, the couple of technologies that got us to where we are now. One little quick, uh, one little quick note on that. Um, yeah, being in Silicon Valley, literally every startup and their dog really uses Kubernetes nowadays. It takes a while for the internet to get to New Zealand. Um, so yeah. Uh, it, it, as Abby said, it, it, yeah, it's certainly worthwhile learning uh, because you know, there'll be a lot of uh, attack surface in future. Um, and part of as a meta point, this talk was really Abby went and learned how Kubernetes worked in the 101 side of stuff, which is what she'll introduce. Uh, um, uh, so hopefully it should be accessible to an unfamiliar audience. So microservices. Um, in the traditional monolith application, the entire application is run as a single process. Microservices are an application that have been separated into smaller independent domains that each perform a specific function. With the application being modular, each microservice can actually be scaled individually, which saves on resources and reduces any chance of a single point of failure. Unlike those traditional monolithic applications that have to recompile, rebuild, and restart with every upgrade, Microservices can be patched without service interruption by rolling out one service at a time. A little bit of container history. Back in the day, we used to run applications on bare metal, but there were some downsides. Bouncing back from faults and failures were slow, and tightly coupled deployments were unnecessarily bulky. We moved to a virtualized environment, and this solved the problem of tightly coupled deployments. Um, and help somewhat with failure recovery. The downside that persisted with virtual machines was the fact that bulky operating systems had to be launched with every new instance. Since containers don't have to run their own operating system, each, system, each instance requires a fraction of the resources in comparison with virtual machines. And when scaled, this efficiency can create some pretty dramatic savings. Not to mention the fact that uh, containers also provide a consistent software environment for developers and testers. Containers are built with the same three basic ingredients despite whatever specific technology uh, that created them. Uh, the first being the manifest. There's a little bit of a sample manifest here written in YAML. Next is the image. You can see the image here. Uh, that Nginx would be the image, um, and the context, which you can see down at the bottom as the container port. So the manifest, YAML here, along with the image, um, all together with the context is what gives us the container itself. So why? Why is it relevant? Why do we use it? What problems did this solve? Managing an application at scale that's made up of tens hundreds or maybe even thousands of containers can really be complex and intensely time consuming if you're using your own scripts or homemade tools. Kubernetes offers major benefits that center around high availability, 
scalability, and disaster recovery. Uh, like I mentioned with microservices and containerization, it does save on resources, but Kubernetes itself offers additional um, resource efficiency in the form of bin packing. Fault tolerance, this is Kubernetes self-healing property. Uh, if a pod fails on one of your worker nodes, uh, control loops will automatically replace it. Scaling, uh, you can either manually or automatically scale your application based on CPU utilization or some custom metrics. And also mentioned updates and rollbacks can be seamlessly deployed to prevent service interruption and service discovery. Um, Kubernetes automatically allows services to find and communicate with each other um, via an internal IP and DNS name. A little bit about the architecture. Uh, first we'll talk about the control plane, then we'll talk about the node plane, and we'll wrap up the 101 portion of this talk with some Kubernetes objects. At a very high level, Kubernetes is made up of one or more control plane nodes and one or more worker nodes. The worker node is where the containerized application ap actually runs, and the control node is where the administration, administrative processes run that manage the cluster. Some components on the control plane. The most important one is this API server here. Um, it coordinates all of the administrative tasks and acts as the entry point to the cluster. It acts as the middle interface for any other component that requires information about the cluster's state and takes calls from users, operators, and external agents. Um, it's the only component that should, should be able to uh, read or write to the etcd. Speaking of etcd, brings us to our next component here. Um, this is where the cluster's state is stored. It's sta stored in key value pairs. Uh, there's one, or two, one of two topographies that you can choose from, uh, the first one being a stack topography, where the etcd is provisioned on the same host as the control plane, or a external topography, where the etcd is provisioned on a dedicated separate host, with the best practice being the external topography for security and fault tolerance. The node plane, the worker nodes. There's a few components here. Um, the first component being the kubelet. The kubelet runs on each worker node and is used to com communicate with the control plane. Uh, it pulls back and waits for any new instructions. Uh, then we have the kube proxy. This is the Kubernetes network proxy that runs on each node. It handles networking and DNS within the cluster and just basically writes a whole heap of IP tables rules on each node. And finally, uh, we have the container runtime. Since Kubernetes doesn't actually run uh, containers itself, it requires a container runtime on the worker nodes to do so. Um, popular examples being Cryo, Rocket, and the most commonly used container D used by Docker. And then finally, some Kubernetes objects. Uh, first we have these pods here. They are the smallest of the Kubernetes objects and is a logical collection of one or more containers. Kubernetes pods are non-permanent objects. They are ephemeral or very short lasting. Uh, they are created or destroyed uh, to keep the current state matching that desired state, which isn't super ideal when you're trying to uh, communicate with any of these pods for your application. Um, to solve that problem, Kubernetes uh, created a higher level abstraction for communication, um, which they call a service, which is our next one. A service logically groups pods through the use of labels and selectors and gives the group a DNS name and a service IP. This also provides some load balancing for the pods um, and allows an, sorry, an ex, a consistent ed, external IP. <laughs> um, these services need to authenticate to each other uh, within the cluster and the way that they are provided an identity is through something called a service account. A ser <laughs> Perfect, good thing you're tall. Uh, a service account provides an identity for processes that run within a pod. And then finally, secrets. The identity for a service account is a token, uh, a token that is mounted within um, a pod. 
whoever has that token can authenticate to uh, um, as that service account. That token is stored in Kubernetes secrets um, and is typically mounted at var run secrets kubernetes.io service account token. So that is a whole heap of information in a very <laughs> short amount of time. And then that is just the tip of the iceberg. This is a pretty complex beast. Um, so if you're confused, don't don't feel bad. Um, I was too for quite some time. Um, but I'm that still com confused. Right? I know. Yeah. Same. So that this complexity is the very reason why it can create such a big attack surface for these clusters, um, which bring us to the next part of our presentation. Absolutely, awesome. Um, cool, so next slide over. Um, so uh, if you haven't figured out by now, uh, K8S is, is the uh, numeronym today I learned um, of, uh, of, uh, of Kubernetes. Um, so if, uh, if you're wondering at all, um, uh, Francesco had a great talk on how much he loves acronyms. Um, uh, so please go up and, and just have a chat with Francesco. Obviously, that's, uh, that's his talk there, which is, of course, Continuous Assurance Automating Cloud Configuration and Security. Um, rolls off the tongue. Um, so uh, yeah, go have a chat with Francesco if, uh, if you want to learn more about um, numeronyms. He loves acronyms. Um, cool. So. Uh, Next up, uh, so we're going to delve into attacking Kubernetes a little bit um, and, uh, and hopefully have a little bit of fun. Um, we'll talk about the overall methodology. Um, so broadly, it, it, you know, this is the, uh, the Threatbot Cyber Viking attack chain. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, Threatbot, rest in peace. Um, uh, we'll go through a few different stages here. Um, so initially enumeration, figuring out about your cluster itself, doing external reconnaissance. Uh, your initial foothold, really you start with a deployment here. Um, uh, privilege escalation, what access do you have? What do you want to get towards? Then finally, persistence. Um, uh, once you have that cluster administrator access, what can you do? What fun can you have? Uh, how can you crush your enemies and see them driven before you? Um, cool. So initially, enumeration, plenty of tools to help you here, really. Uh, so kube audit, kube striker, kube bench, kube hunter, pretty much any kube plus word, Google it, you'll find some sort of tool. Um, uh, really, you need the address of the API server itself. Um, uh, these can be found in kube config files. Um, uh, also, credentials are a great place to pilfer from there if you end up on a machine. Um, uh, but one thing of note here is really this super short upgrade life cycle of clusters. For example, 1.18 was released a year and seven months ago. It was end of life four months ago. So that was a year and three months from, hey, we've launched this to we're not supporting it anymore. Uh, there are no real long term uh, LTS versions at the moment. Um, so yeah, most people don't keep up to date with patching. So when you look at external recon, look for versions, and yeah, more often than not, they're out of date. Uh, next up, uh, we've got uh, the initial foothold here. Uh, so if you find yourself with shell in an application, there's a great tool, Am I Contained by Jess Frizzell, uh, which tells you not only which container runtime is, uh, is, is, is operating there, but also what are some of the system syscalls and capabilities and some of the goodies that you have uh, the ability to do. Um, but yeah, broadly there, there's your standard you know, RCE and application, right? We're talking about attacking Kubernetes, so we're talking about attacking the infrastructure itself post-exploitation of an application. Um, other ways that you can get there, deployment by you know, developers and CI via the normal flow, convincing a dev to you know, sneak in some malicious code, um, or uh, external packages as well, right? Backdoor images, dependencies, um, you know, the old left pad issue that everyone's still very familiar with. Um, uh, we'll discuss uh, some interesting stuff around supply chain at the end as well. Uh, and then so stolen credentials, of course. So stealing credentials for uh, users, uh, as I mentioned, stealing from the kube config file, um, or services, uh, the service account tokens, we'll, we'll, we'll have a bit of a demo about that. Um, SSH access into nodes and so on. Um, but if you end up uh, on a machine with uh, uh, access that has auth, you know, developer's machine, um, if you want to get into a pod, it's kube control exec, or kube cuddle uh, is, uh, is uh, another way it's pronounced. Um, but you can just exec straight into pods if you have the, the permissions to do so. Um, so from that point, you've got a shell on a pod. What do you do next? Um, you want these container breakouts, um, which sounds a lot more fancy than they really are. They're just misconfigurations of, of the ways that uh, you know, containers can work in terms of mounts and, and networking and so on. Uh, there's this tool here called uh, Pirates, Pirates, I think. It's the Greek word for pirate um, by the Ingardians uh, team. It's a pretty interesting tool. Um, uh, it does a lot of the enumeration for you of what's possible um, from within a container. Um, but broadly, the way that will always work for you uh, uh, within uh, most Kubernetes accounts uh, is really service account um, uh, dancing. So you steal the secrets from, uh, you know, the steal, steal the, token, uh, the token from secrets. I need less caffeine. 
Um, uh, <laughs> you steal from that path there, uh, which is where it's mounted on desk. Uh, yeah, uh, via run secrets Kubernetes IO service account token. Um, and then this wonderful, wonderful helper function. Uh, up until a little while ago, um, actually it's been there for a little, uh, for, for a few versions now, but um, uh, prior to, to kube control auth can I list, you had to go through and enumerate what of each of the different permissions. So you got a service account token, what can I do with this? You got to go and try and fail. And then the developers, bless them, went and put in this helper that gives you a matrix of everything. These are the things you can do. You're allowed to access these, uh, these verbs in these namespaces against these uh, objects. So handy, really handy for an attacker's perspective. Um, uh, then there's also the ability to impersonate as service accounts as well. So the dash dash as service account or dash dash as user allows you to auth as the initial user you, you, you are, but then if you have the ability to impersonate other users, you can then behave as them. Um, so that's a good way, obviously, for privilege escalation from there, um, if you have the capabilities to do so. Um, and then uh, the final bit, uh, some of the fun things that you can do once, uh, once you have clustered. Added. Oh, uh, I forgot about this one as well. So this is a, a, a tweet goal from, uh, from Duffy Cooley, Maui Lion. Um, great guy to follow on Twitter when it comes to um, uh, general Kubernetes security. He used to run a, a podcast called TGIK, um, which has a lot of uh, really interesting material on there. Uh, but this is a one-liner, technically, um, that if you have the ability to run uh, workloads on a cluster, say pretty standard developer account, um, and they're not necessarily checking the security configuration of it, um, this will give you shell in a pod that has uh, within the root namespace on a node. Um, so root access to a node if you can trigger deployments. Uh, I've recently retweeted that, so follow me uh, at NFFrenchy or follow uh, at my line. It is from a while ago, 2019, um, so yeah, it's, it's probably easy to find via my account. Um, but yeah, that's uh, one handy way that you can probably escalate to um, having root on the node. Uh, and then persistence. So say you get to a point where you have cluster admin access, right? Star dot star. Um, you can have a lot of fun there. <laughs> There's some real like, like cr amazing creative stuff that you can do within the complexity of Kubernetes. So malicious daemon sets. Daemon sets are effectively, uh, um, yeah, daemons are processes that run on each of the nodes. Whenever a new node is created, it'll automatically create the same daemon set on there. So if you want to have all of the new nodes in a cluster connect back to your C2 infrastructure, Great, um, you can do that. Uh, malicious CRDs, this is a blog post that came out a couple of days ago. Uh, turns out it's probably not as impactful as, um, as, as, we, as we thought, but CRDs are custom resource definitions. So we've talked about services and pods, their resources that exist. When versions are in beta or you want to extend your own cluster, you can write a custom resource definition. Um, and Kubernetes also uses these CRDs for their own internals. Uh, and you can stomp on those internals. So you can overwrite the API server's CRD. Um, Turns out it doesn't actually overwrite the API server, but it still causes some funky with behavior with how Kube uh, control clients handle this stuff. Um, so smell test is kind of there. If you want to play around and look at some stuff, this could be really interesting. Um, malicious admission control. Um, if you've seen me present before, you might have heard me waffle on about a thing called K-Rail. Um, K-Rail is an admission control tool for good that we wrote at Cruise. Um, uh, and in that case, it's like, hey, you know, before you're allowed in, the API server sends it off to admission control and says, hey, is this good or bad? Do we want to you know, mutate this, change it a little bit? Here's a list of security policies, thumbs up, thumbs down, we're letting you into our cluster. Well, it turns out you can have malicious admission control, which is, hey, you're submitting a workload with secrets, we will let you right in, but not before we send a copy of those secrets off to Frenchie. Kind of handy as well. Um, that idea and C2 Benetti's, which we'll talk at the end there, is, uh, belongs to Ian Coldwater and Brad Giesman. Um, 2019 Black Hat talk, I believe. Um, pretty awesome talk there. Uh, then the last little section we'll talk about um, some sneaky modes. So say you, you, like, you want to uh, evade from an administrator. Uh, so in this case, all of the things we've talked about, like daemon sets, CRDs, if I as administrator go, hey, something funky is happening on my cluster, go and query the API server, hey, what's going on? Kube control, get. CRDs, I'm gonna see that funky stuff has happened. Say you wanna fly under that radar. Um, statically defined pods are a pretty great way to do this. So statically defined pods, if you have a file system mount on the host and you can drop a YAML file into that directory there, um, uh, etcd, uh, etc kubelet d, uh, that pod uh, uh, will be created not talking to the API server at all. It'll, the kubelet will look in that directory and go, oh cool, I meant to create this pod, I will go and create this pod. Uh, it bypasses the API server. So it bypasses admission control. Um, if you're in a namespace that exists, it'll register with the API server and say, hey, by the way, you're here. But if you create a statically defined pod in a namespace that doesn't exist, the API server never finds out about it, and you have a pod that's running that's completely stealthy. 
Um, if you can overwrite the Kubernetes manifest kube API server, that's the actual manifest. We're talking about CRD stomping on the API server. That's the real one. If you can edit that, you can change the API server. Uh, and then finally, my favorite one, which again, uh, Ian Coldwater and Brad Giesman, um, great to uh, see Honk. Um, C Kubernetes is probably the, the coolest way of abusing uh, Kubernetes I, I've heard of in uh, the last few years. Basically, once you have root access to a node and you have the ability to install stuff, you install your own Kubernetes agent. Any administrator is going to look at it and be like, there's a kubelet, there's a kubelet process, two are running, eh, not too much of a big deal. Um, but you then enroll yours out to your own API server somewhere else, not within the cluster. It goes and talks somewhere else. They're probably not going to look at 443 and go, hmm, that's suspicious. It's fine. It's there. It's, you know, it's meant to happen, especially if you target it and say, oh, it's an API server running in AWS for Kubernetes. Oh, it's another API server running in AWS for Kubernetes. Yeah, it's probably legit. Um, but you then have full control of all the nodes. You can have full visibility onto the workloads, all the secrets, full cluster compromise, and it's pretty invisible. Um, so C2 Kubernetes, pretty, pretty sweet. Um, Cool. Uh, if you want to have a go at practicing some of your pew-pew, um, uh, Honk CI, uh, Honk CTL is uh, uh, by uh, a couple of people out of the States. Um, it was a really fun CTF, which is just purely within um, uh, Kubernetes. Um, not too much of a spoiler alert with some of the stuff that we'll be talking about, but you know, if you want to give it a go, maybe put your fingers in your ears. Um, uh, Kubernetes Goat as well as another intentionally vulnerable Kubernetes cluster. Um, and with that, um, I'll jump over and do a quick time check and uh, switch over to the demo bit. Uh, so, can you all see that? Is that big enough? Is the audience dead? Uh, yeah. Yes, good. <laughs> Land of living dead. Wonderful. All right, so. Cool. So we can see here, um, uh, this little who am I thing is not actually as part of the kube control client. It's a, it's a helper I've got. But we start off with this no fun allowed user. Uh, because remember, no fun allowed in this talk. Uh, so then uh, we can see what we do uh, with this. We try and access some secrets. Nah, ba -bow. error message, not allowed to have it. OK, so then we use this wonderful helper, Korth Anna, can I, I can't spell. Oh, man, that presentation is terrible. Basically, it spits out this matrix, um, which we had not tested on the big screen, obviously enough. Uh, but what it does tell us, which you can kind of make sense of, service accounts read-only user impersonate. So we have the ability, even though this no fun allowed user is there, it does have the ability to impersonate this read-only user, which is a pretty common use case. There's sometimes there might be a super locked down uh, service account, and then the devs are just like, well, we've got to read, you know, access, we need these images, so yeah, give us access to read-only. Yep, totally fair, we'll do it. it. Seems like about the same risk, won't be too different. Um, so, all right, well then let's do that, but we'll auth list as that specific user. See what that gives us. It gives us a frozen prompt. There we are. I thought I was going to have to sacrifice myself. There yeah, no, we were joking. Abby <laughs> was like, between the two of us, one of us was going to have to sacrifice ourselves to the demo gods. Um, but so far, so good. All right, so yeah, here, what can I do as that read only? So again, formatting is terrible, but basically what this tells us is like, cool, yep, you've got read only access. You don't have the ability to execute anything, but it does have read only access to secrets. Cool. We know what's in secrets, service account tokens. Let's go have a look at secrets now, see what we can get. So we're, we'll do the same. OK, auth can I, yeah, instead of auth can I, I want to start looking at some secrets. Cool, get secrets. Oh, this spits out a bunch of interesting stuff, which again, formatting is pretty shocking. Uh, but you can see admin token. All right, that sounds like a party. We've got read only user, already have access to that. No fun allowed. Default token, sure. And then admin token. All right, let's see if we can read what's in that. Might be some juicy stuff in there. Cool. K get secrets as this service account. Instead of getting secrets, we're going to describe specifically that admin one, admin token, blah. Bam, spits out a token for us. This is that service account token that we can then pilfer. And if we put into our config, we're now the, we can pretend to be this, this user. Um, so let's do just that. So we'll create this little server config thing where we're telling it we want to speak to this specific um, cluster, the, the kind cluster is the one I spun up locally, uh, as admin, um, user admin. And then we'll also create this new user here, config set co credential that we just pilfered, this token, bam. Then we'll switch it as that user. 
CPX admin, yep. And then let's have a look at what we can do. Uh, apart from the fact that I can't type, it should show us that we are user, admin, and then also, can auth can I? Another terribly formatted matrix which basically has start up star at the top. So we've gone from like a uh, user that has absolutely no access whatsoever uh, up to read only user which has the ability to pilfer secrets. From that we steal the token privilege escalate up to admin. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, cool. So we'll switch back to our slides. Uh, cool. Um, so how can you fix some of these issues? So that was one specific example we we're talking around privilege escalation from stealing service accounts. Um, uh, not all of these are fixed. In fact, only number four is really the only relevant one to that. Uh, broadly though, you absolutely should be patching um, your, your clusters. The short life cycle makes it hard. Uh, make it a cloud provider's problem. Use Amazon, use Google, use Azure. Um, they've got uh, Kubernetes products for each of those. Um, the more you can offload to them, uh, and the less you have to administer with the clusters itself, the better. Um, K-Rail, as we mentioned, is a tool. Um, admission control broadly. OPA Gatekeeper is, is kind of the most popular one at the moment. Um, uh, but check your workloads before you allow them on the cluster um, uh, uh, for uh, general security configurations. Um, one kind of cool thing is previously pod security policies uh, were the preferred way that people would want to reason about attributes uh, when it comes to security in pods. They've been deprecated in version 1.21. They're now moving towards admission control. So it feels kind of nice that you know, we wrote a tool called K-Rail and now that feature has been kind of mainstreamed up into Kubernetes as the preferred way of, uh, of managing uh, security. It's not just because of that, like there's a lot of people that push it in the direction, but it's, it's cool to see that. Um, third one there, Salsa and SBOM. Um, uh, Salsa, I always have to look at the slides for this because I have not remembered the acronym, but supply chain level for software artifacts. Um, and SBOM, which is software bill of materials. We mentioned uh, supply chain security uh, when it comes to uh, looking at uh, images. Um, most people, when they're deploying stuff, don't know what's actually in, in their uh, containers or uh, all their applications. Um, uh, there's a whole long list. Whereas a car, right? Like, you know, recently there was a, a recall of batteries in, um, uh, in uh, GM cars uh, because LG put out a bad battery, right? That comes from a software bill of, mat a bill of materials in the car. They know exactly what's in it, right? We don't do that for software. SBOM is an attempt to do that. Um, Salsa is a framework that gives you the, the ability to know what's uh, in your... Uh, uh, what's, what, what you're running in your environments with levels of maturity. So you start level zero, you don't really know. As you progress and mature, you're not only, you know, you've got uh, itemization of what's actually being, being run in terms of all your dependencies, but you're also doing signing around assets and making sure that things are getting pulled in. So you've got um, cryptographic verification. Then finally, uh, the one that will actually prevent that demo that I talked about, audit to RBAC. Um, so audit to RBAC is a tool which you can run, which talks to the API server and says, hey, for this specific user, what have they actually done? What do they really need to do? You can then audit and say this access is expected. You know, no fun allowed should be accessing read only. That makes sense. No fun allowed should not be accessing secrets. What the hell? That's kind of weird. Um, uh, and then from there, you can more uh, finely grain uh, scope your uh, role-based access control or, or ABAC as well. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a couple of fixes that you want to think about. Um, and with that, um, I'll hand it over to Abby for the recap. Yeah, so we've talked about the introduction. Um, I went over all of the basics. We went over the Kube 101. Um, Brent just talked about some attack methodology and the fixes. Yep, cool. And with that, we're done. We'll get out of the way for beer. Thanks so much. <laughs>